Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to Naturally Arkansas, a webinar series hosted by the Central Arkansas Library System. I'm the host, Lynn Foster, and I'd like to thank CALS for its enthusiastic support of this series. So thank you, CALS. Um, Naturally Arkansas focuses on environmental issues, particularly those that we individuals can do something about. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube on the Central Arkansas Library System channel, where you can also find our past recordings. Before we begin, let me note that we are in webinar mode, so your microphone and camera are off. And also let me say that if you have questions, please post them in the chat and not in Q&A because I will not be monitoring Q&A, but I will be monitoring the chat for questions. I'd also um, like to uh, tell you that next month we'll be presenting two webinars on August 2nd, sorry, that should be August 4th, Thursday, August 4th, Anne and David Holcomb and I will be discussing uh, more aspects of native habitat, habitat gardening during fall and winter, as well as removing invasive non-natives. And we'll also be answering your questions. On August 25th, Leslie Cooper um, from uh, Quails Forever Arkansas, Joe Ledvina, who I believe works for Arkansas Department of Transportation, and I will be talking all about monarch butterflies. Uh, the butterflies themselves, statewide programs involving them, and how to garden for them. But meanwhile, tonight, our honored guest is Bruce McMath, retired attorney, former president of the Central Arkansas Astronomical Society, and current chair of the Arkansas Natural Sky Association. He's going to uh, educate us on what light pollution is, how it affects nature, and what we can do about it. So. Um, Bruce, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to start your slideshow right now. Uh, welcome. Thank you for agreeing to present. And, um, and please start us off with an overview of the problem. Let me back up here real quick. There we go. Looks so, great. Yeah. For overview or perspective, I like to refer to it as, how about let's go back 10 or 12,000 years. Uh, <clears throat> that may seem a, a bit much, but it was about that time that uh, our ancestors uh, uh, undertook a monumental uh, a step, uh, a unique uh, uh, event in, the, in the, the history of the world. Because prior to that, no species in the four and a half billion year history of the planet had, uh, had done what they were about to do. And that is, they weren't just adapting to their environment, but they were consciously starting to change their environment to adapt it to them. Uh, a monumental event, as I say, and perhaps one that will come to be seen as defining our current time in a very serious way. But be that as it may, few people would deny that we've benefited greatly from this process. But along the way, we have also learned that this comes with certain risks. Uh, 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 mishaps uh, that are often are latent in nature. You don't see them until they're upon you. And light pollution is just the most recent of these to, uh, to take place, to, to come to light, so to speak, to use a pun. Uh, <clears throat> the problem is, the good thing about it is, it's a fairly easily, uh, easy problem to address. The problem is, is most people uh, remain completely ignorant of the problem. And even those who have heard of it think it's just about losing the stars. Uh, and of course, losing the stars is important. It's a, it's a, it's a legitimate concern uh, because it warps our situational awareness to isolate ourselves from the pla our place in the universe. It changes our perspective about our place in nature. Uh, this photograph uh, illustrates, uh, uh, is taken from the, uh, it illustrates what we've lost. Uh, it's a picture of the summer Milky Way taken from Boston, Arkansas by a friend of mine. And the soft glow there that you see, the streak from upper left to lower right is the Milky Way galaxy. It's a galaxy that we inhabit. 
that our sun is part of. And all that glow is from uh, over 100 billion uh, individual stars. And the dark areas that you see in there, that's not where there's nothing. That's where there's so much gas and ash or soot, if you will, from stars, previous, uh, previous star uh, generations of stars that you can't see through it to the stars beyond it. Uh, this uh, uh, spectacle uh, until a few generations ago was a very real part and a practical element in our ancestors' world, as real to them as our cell phones uh, are to us. Uh, it was clock, compass, calendar, and Netflix. I say Netflix, why? Because they hung the stories of their gods, their heroes, their villains, the themes of their culture on the patterns they saw in the stars. It was a constant series of reruns over the campfire. As each season passed, you'd see last, last year's <laughs> version slightly revised. <clears throat> but there's more uh, to light pollution, and then we'll, as we will learn in the course of this discussion, than hiding the stars. Uh, because for five billion years, the biology of, of everything that has evolved on this planet has evolved under this so-called diurnal cycle of light and day. And it is uh, hardwired into the biology uh, of every living thing on the, on the, that lives on the surface of the planet, including us humans. Uh, not at the behavioral level, but at the metabolic, at the, uh, at the level of hormones. Uh, <clears throat> and we have changed or traded this nightly spectacle of our place in the universe for this which is artificial day. And all of that light that's going up in the sky there and hiding the stars and hiding our place in the universe is wasted energy. And this slide illustrates how rapidly and how recently this phenomenon has occurred. And you can see why we were only now beginning to recognize uh, that there's a problem. This begins, this illustrates the level of light pollution in the 50s. When I was a youngster, I lived here right here in Little Rock and I could lay in the yard and see the stars that I cannot see now. And this is, uh, projects on into the future if we continue, the rate of light pollution continues to grow at the, uh, at the current rate. Now, beyond that, uh, the, the reality is, is that light that pollutes, as I say, is wasted energy. It's also not good lighting. It's poor lighting. It undermines visibility, public safety, and the aesthetics of our communities. Uh, but as I noted before, the beautiful thing or the nice thing about this problem is, is it can be solved. It actually saves money and you get better lighting when you light responsibly. So to bring this home to, look, to Arkansas, this is just a light pollution map of Arkansas with Little Rock there, more or less in the middle, Memphis over on the right. Uh, you can see uh, Fort Smith and then Fayetteville, Rogers, Springdale area up in the Northwest, Texarkana near the lower, nor lower left. There is no naturally dark place left in Arkansas. Even the Ozark and Washita National Forest do not have totally naturally dark skies. That is so sad to hear, Bruce. Um, I thought there might be some patches up there in the in those national forests, if nowhere else. Um, well, they get really close. <laughs> okay, well, that's really good close. to know. That's yeah. good to know. I'll be asking you a little bit about that at the end. Um, and uh, I hadn't realized, but when I started doing research for this presentation, um, there are different kinds of light pollution. And so um, I asked Bruce to talk a little bit about what those are. Yeah, it, uh, uh, basically light pollution is any light that's emitted into the environment that's not useful uh, because at the very least, it's wasted energy at that point. Uh, and depending on the circumstances and the character of it, characteristic of it, can do the harms that I've alluded to and that we will discuss further as we go through. But basically it falls into four general characteristics, glare, 
uh, which is a bright light, uh, you know, in your eyes. We've all experienced this, uh, particularly if we're drivers in these uh, recent years with the blue headlights, uh, that's glare. Uh, uh, sky glow, which we showed a picture of earlier with the artificial uh, day over the urban environment. Uh, trespass, when we are careless with our lighting and we shine it on someone else's uh, a property and perhaps into their bedroom where it'll do harm. Uh, and clutter, which is just distracting uh, uh, and, and can be disorienting. Those are the four big care, uh, categories of light pollution. Thank you. Um, so we know that light pollution hides the stars, wastes energy and money, but what are the other ways in which it's bad? Well, one that is often overlooked, even by people who are starting to learn about this, is the contribution to greenhouse gases. It is a significant aspect of our carbon footprint as a, as a society. Uh, and uh, a 100 watt light bulb that's coal fired, left on all night for a year, generates almost a half a ton of carbon dioxide. So just think about all the lights that are left on all night for little or no purpose uh, across this country. Uh, it also alters, as I've alluded to, the diurnal cycle. It creates an artificial uh, day, uh, and that impacts animal, plant, and human health. Uh, it can contribute to crime and accidents because poor lighting, as I alluded to before, uh, can reduce visibility, and lighting can attract crime, it turns out. Uh, and it can create nuisance and trespass. There's literally nothing good. There's no redeeming value to light pollution by definition. And uh, I, uh, I want to drill down a little bit on the, on the biological impacts uh, in the context of humans. And I start there because I think when, we, when you realize how it can impact human beings, then you, uh, who, who, you know, that have some ability, sentient ability to uh, uh, respond to it, uh, it illustrates how deeply uh, in influential this can be for uh, other creatures. Uh, the American Medical Association issued the, their first public health warning about the risks of, of light pollution in 2009. Uh, they've since issued another one in 2016 that focuses on the concerns with blue light or the blue content and LED lighting that we're using more and more outdoors. But they pointed out that uh, uh, artificial light, exposure to artificial light at night, disrupts human and animal circadian rhythms and in, has a, a demonstrates an increased risk of diabetes, depression, obesity, and cancers, particularly breast and prostate. All these things, by the way, are uh, epidemic in modern society. Think about it, diabetes, depression, obesity, breast and prostate cancer. Uh, uh, there is a risk of blinding glare from inappropriate lighting, which is a safety hazard. And they advocated uh, out using energy efficient outdoor lighting that is fully shielded. So uh, you're now going to ask me about how let's to translate this to the uh, to the animal and insect world. I, I am. Um, <laughs> thank you for anticipating that, Bruce, and switching to the next slide. <laughs> Um, we are going to not focus so much on harm to humans tonight, but we're going to look at the ways in which light pollution affects nature, um, more, more, much more so animals than plants, although it certainly can affect plants. And as we turn to this subject, um, I'd like to mention a recent and very outstanding book by Ed Yong, Y O. NG called An Immense World, How Animal Senses Reveal the Hidden Realms Around Us. And as I speak, I'm posting that in chat and I'm giving you the link to uh, the CALS uh, entry for that book. CALS has several copies for loan. I believe they have hard copy. I know they have electronic copy because um, I asked them to order it and they did. Um, and the book's theme is how animals sense the world and the many different ways in which their senses differ from ours. The last chapter of the book deals with light and sound pollution, and it's particularly relevant to our discussion tonight. And his basic theme is that we are 
harming animals because we are so unaware of how our sound pollution and our light pollution affects their perception of the world. Um, and, and most of the time, almost all the time, it's not in a good way. So, um, so back to you, Bruce. So uh, Germany is one of the first countries I'm aware of, uh, if not the first country to pass laws addressing outdoor lighting, specifically because of a concern that the biomass of the country is collapsing. Uh, light pollution has a dramatic impact on insects and and it impacts plants and i'll just start there with uh, because when you impact the plants it has a, 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 a roll-on effect with the insects uh y y i have pictures of uh, uh trees that uh, fail to lose their leaves on the street light side of the tree when they shed them on the other side uh outdoor lighting can cause plants to think it's not just diurnal. The lighting cycle is not just a diurnal signal. The, the, the seasonal cycle, the lengthening and shortening of the days of the day and night uh, cycle tells plants and animals what season it is. And so plants under exposed to uh, artificial light can mature faster or sooner. And so if you're a, a migrating moth or a newly hatched insect, and you're expecting to feed on the newly sprouting tender leaves of the plant life in the area. And that plant life has sprouted, has, uh, has emerged early and hardened. Uh, you are in, you're in trouble. Uh, the lighting can miss, uh, can lead to confusion about uh, the, the very geography of the place. Uh, street lights on an asphalt road can look like water. And many ins, uh, uh, insects uh, uh, lay their eggs in watery environments. And so they're misled and those are lost, um, it's lost reproduction. Uh, the life cycle uh, is a night and day process. Most insects or probably all insects have are, are cued to different behaviors depending on whether it's night or day. They may hide out in the day and then at night they come out and feed and breed and so forth. If you have an artificial day, they don't do that. And so they don't thrive. Um, uh, you have phyto uh, phyto uh, uh, taxis, phyto taxis, which means they're attracted to light. Uh, um, and by the way, we'll see in a little bit that happens with birds too. But uh, we all know how insects are attracted to light and they can just uh, be attracted and they just are trapped by the light and uh, die or fly themselves to death. I was at uh, Mount, I lost the photograph and I don't know how I did it, but I was struck at uh, Mount Magazine. I was visiting up there about perhaps becoming a dark sky park uh, by the, a string, at least four dozen daddy long, I mean, uh, walking sticks that had been attracted to the uh, back door light. And there, there's just this carcasses strewn up. Some of them had gotten up to the light, but they were all dead. So this is a, a photo taxis. Uh, it can create or change the uh, a predator prey uh, balance uh, lighting, uh, uh, artificial lighting can and on and on. This goes on to more complicated uh, species. Everybody's heard about the sea turtles, I'm sure, on this call, uh, how the moon, they, they hatch at the full moon. And that's critical because uh, uh, the predator birds are going to be after them the minute they hatch. They've got to get to the water ASAP to survive. Uh, and they have to know where the water is. And the way they know is the moonlight on the wavelets uh, of the ocean. That's what guides them. But if you happen to be uh, uh, hatching out, on a beach with a city behind you, uh, uh, it's, uh, it, uh, it, you get confused and you don't make it. Uh, let's talk about amphibians. Uh, you know, you have been out in the country, you've heard the, the, uh, the frogs, well, that's mating, but they do that at night and they, and they won't, they, uh, uh, artificial uh, light will discourage, pre prevent, or um, uh, inhibit that. Uh, other mating 
uh, goes back to insects. Uh, we probably something we've all experienced if we live here in an urban environment, and that's uh, fireflies. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, the city yards, our yards here in the city were full of fireflies in the season. Uh, if you're uh, anywhere near as old as I am, you've probably noticed that there aren't as many fireflies. And that's because that flashing is a reproductive process and it's inhibited uh, in the context it becomes less effective uh, in light pollution. Uh, again, predator prey, uh, it shrinks habitat uh, and uh, it impacts uh, growth, maturation, uh, and migration, all kinds of species. This, this photograph is dramatic. I hope it plays. It's supposed to play. Here we go. There it goes. These are birds. Birds are also impacted by phototaxis. These are birds trapped in the uh, spotlights at the World Trade Center uh, uh, event they have each year. Uh, uh, and uh, this is uh, what proved to be a disaster. And so what they do now is, is they turn these lights off periodically uh, during the events to let the birds escape. But if you'll, you'll notice uh, the birds fly through those beams, they fly out and then they come right back, uh, circle back into the light. Some have speculated it's because they, their vision has been impacted by the bright light. And then when they fly out of them, they can't see and they turn back. But at any rate, that's pretty dramatic. Um, Bruce, could I say a couple things before you sure. move to the, to the next slide? Um, I, I would like to point out that almost all of these, if not all these birds are migrating birds. And of course, migrating birds are under a lot of stress already because they're traveling thousands of miles typically from their, um, from their summer homes to their winter homes in September. And um, Ed Young covers this problem specifically in his book. And I just wanted to share a couple of sentences um, about what observers saw uh, when, the, when the tribute to light, which is what this is called, was on. Warblers and other small species congregate within the light at densities up to 150 times their normal levels. They circle slowly as if trapped within an incorporeal cage. They call frequently and intensely they occasionally crash into nearby buildings. And of course they would be doing none of these things if this light pollution was not in the sky. But as Bruce pointed out, um, they have mitigated this to a great extent because now there are Audubon monitors. And when there are more than a thousand birds are in the beams, they're turned off for 20 minutes. But again, this is just one building. Um, and even though there's a super amount of light coming from this one building, think about downtown Little Rock, downtown St. Louis, downtown Chicago, et cetera. Where people leave all the lights on in the building. Yeah. Uh, thoughtlessly. I mean, they, it's, it's vanity. Yes. Uh, uh, and, and mindless marketing, because the truth of the matter is, does it, does it affect your, who you do business with because they've left their lights on downtown? Well, maybe it should in an adverse way, but uh, <laughs> it's certainly not beneficial, but it's impulsive. It's an impulsive look at me, vanity thing that we do in all kinds of situations. And it's wasteful of energy, it creates carbon needlessly, and it impacts our environment. So uh, going on with the birds, uh, the Audubon and IDA have partnered, and I believe this, uh, these surveys, these bird collision surveys began before the partnership, but uh, certainly it's, it's, it's part of it. Uh, uh, in these large, particularly in cities with large buildings, uh, volunteers go out and, and do um, uh, each morning and collect and count and inventory the bird deaths. Millions of birds are estimated to die each year during the migration by becoming disoriented uh, by city lights and flying into uh, the buildings that are illuminated. 600 million birds a year, which is twice, a little, almost twice uh, the a population of America. Um, I, I have one comment about that, about that slide that you just showed. 
And that is that um, University of Arkansas at Fayetteville um, was the site of a survey this spring. And um, some folks up there got volunteers together and counted bird strikes, I guess, on the campus. Um, Thankfully, uh, it was a fairly low number. They found that 39 birds were killed, but they only surveyed over a 12 hour period. So it's not a very long survey. Um, sounds like it was just one, one night. Uh, most were thrush species and all were natives. And I don't believe that anybody is conducting a similar project anywhere here in central Arkansas, but maybe that's, if you know any, uh, you know, ornithology or biology or ecology majors, maybe that would be something to suggest to them um, because uh, I know that there are a lot of bird strikes at night here. By the way, these days we can monitor the migration of birds. It's, so, it's such a dense process that they show up on radar. Yes. And that has become a way to, to monitor that. But in the, in the olden days, <laughs> uh, you, they would do surveys by full moonlight. This sort of, uh, I don't know if they intended to do that here, but what you would go out, people would go out with uh, binoculars or small telescopes and uh, by, uh, by using moonlight, you could capture, you could see the birds fly through the, the image of the moon uh, and, and calculate from that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the extent of the migration. Uh, that's just an aside. Uh, so uh, here in uh, the central part of the country, the Missouri IDA chapter and, and ANSA has joined this effort, um, uh, has this uh, Lights Out Heartland project in different areas of the country have initiated this. Again, this is an Audubon IDA joint venture. And uh, we hope that ANSA will be able to, be, that we will get an active program here in the not too distant future. It is a question of volunteer resources uh, to make this happen. Um, I've got a technical question here from Nathan. Uh, there's a problem with Zoom and our attendees cannot send messages. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was kind of wondering why we weren't getting any questions or comments. Um, the best option is to have them email questions. Do you want me to have them sent to me or to you? Um, how about you, Nathan? And so I guess, okay. And so you're gonna put them in chat then, right? Okay, all right. Sorry about that interruption. That's all right. Back so to you. You were gonna ask me now what we can do to, uh, to address these problems. Yes, uh, I was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, so this sort of goes back to the types of light pollution that exist because those different types come from discrete sources. Uh, and uh, those sources are primarily improperly aimed and shielded fixtures. It's important to shield light, send it down and put it where you need it. Uh, Overlighting, and that's particularly become a big problem as we transition to LED fixtures. For lots of reasons, you not only need fewer watts, but you need fewer lumens. And this is because of the color change. Uh, and people don't realize that. And they go to the store and they get an LED bulb and they, they try to get the same lumen level that they had from their incandescent bulb. And you end up with way too much light, uh, which is not good light in addition to being wasteful. Uh, unmonitored dust to dawn lighting. There's this uh, huge tendency uh, to think that we need to turn lights on and leave them on uh, all night, uh, which is rarely, in fact, useful. Uh, failure to use timers and sensors is sort of the, the flip side of that. Vanity look at me lighting that I've mentioned and marketing look at me lighting. So those are the sources of useless, wasteful light that creates uh, problems. Now, glare, we drill down just a little bit on glare. This illustrates how glare is a safety risk, according to the AMA and actually is poor lighting and results in less uh, visibility, not more. Uh, now this is a camera, but the same thing happens with the eye. If you expose the, the eye to the source of light, the eye adjusts to that bright light and then everything around it becomes a black drum. If you've ever been at a campfire and tried to look in the woods over a campfire, you've experienced that. You're in a black drum. 
you turn your back to the fire, you can see into the woods. So glare. After a while, after your yeah. eyes get used to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your eyes have to readjust. But then you can see, in fact, it's amazing how well you can see uh, without light, in, in, even on a dark night. Uh, unshielded and misdirected light. Now, this is actually a spike light where one neighbor had APNL or Entergy come out and install a bright light and shine it on their neighbors. But this, <laughs> this can happen uh, uh, thoughtlessly as well as on, on purpose. Um, and in this case, she had to put up all kinds of shields and stuff to keep the light out of her, out of her house. Overlighting. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, you know, out here where I live around near Pinnacle, um, lots of people have the energy lights in their yards. And one question that I've wondered about is whether energy ever talks about shielding or anything like that with people. Do you know the answer to that question? Is it just like what the customer wants they get? And people are probably totally unaware of this issue. Call, call me jaded. Okay. Yeah. Entergy, Entergy's uh, purpose there is to move electricity at night. It's off peak and use, there's no accelerator on a coal fired power plant. So the power companies have forever pushed this idea that lighting is a security device, which it can be, but unmonitored light generally is more likely just to attract crime than it is to discourage it. That's what the Justice Department has told Congress. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Illumination Engineering Society tells us that, that light on a motion sensor is the most effective security lighting. Uh, but they want to move electricity at night and they use the cheapest fixtures that they call them, we call them barnyard lights that throw light. Only about 30% of the light that comes out of one of those fixtures actually illuminates an area where the light is useful. The rest of it is glare and results in light trespass and sky glow. So you couldn't design a, a fixture more effectively to waste light unless you turned it upside down uh, and just shined it up in the sky. So uh, this is, a, and, and it is common to overlight, as I indicate, this is uh, some quote security lighting installed at an apartment complex, again by uh, Entergy, a utility company. Uh, the Illumination Engineering Society says this should be about 30 lux in this common area. Uh, we measured this at 530. Uh, you can see what happens. It's so bright in the foreground that you, it becomes completely dark past that second pine tree. You can't see anything uh, behind, uh, beyond that pine tree. And then these were low income uh, apartments. They only had one window and everybody had blocked their window, to keep the light out of, their, out of their house, which deprived them of daylight in the day, right. which is equally important to your health. So uh, uh, over lighting, here's a commercial over lighting comparing a proper uh, uh, lighting situation, less glare, less light, but plenty to do what is necessary. Uh, this sort of sums up most of the bad traits of, of um, irresponsible or inappropriate lighting in one, one photograph. This was out near Pinnacle Park. Uh, you can see, first of all, it's way too bright so that you have that, you can't see where the light, it's completely pitch black past the other side of that building, which raises security questions. If you think lighting is important to your security, you have completed a completely blind situation over there by over lighting the foreground here. Uh, it's aimed sideways, not down. So the light is going off on other people's property and about half of it is going up in the sky. It's the wrong color. It's got loaded with blue, white light. It needs to war outdoor light to reduce the biological impact. It needs to have low blue light content. Uh, and, and consequence to having that high blue content. You see all that in there that looks like snow? That's yeah. insects. Insects flying themselves to death and the ground was littered with their carcasses. Uh, just one light uh, doing that kind of, uh, uh, so the solution, and, and I got ahead of you, I'm sorry, but you were gonna ask me, what do we gotta do, <laughs> right? Uh, no, go ahead. It's yeah. fine. So th there are four principles to responsible lighting. Now, this is a huge educational uh, 
problem you can see because solving this problem, it requires individual action. Uh, uh, and that's all that's required, fortunately, but it does require individual action. So it's the four principles of responsible lighting, only light where needed. And that goes back to the shielding and aiming. Only light when needed. That means using curfews, motion sensors, timers, and switches. Uh, my dad said when I was growing up uh, to turn the light off when you weren't using it. <laughs> Pretty simple pr uh, principle. Avoid overlighting and use appropriate, and, and usually that means the minimum light necessary to do what it is you need to do and use appropriate color light for the purpose, which outdoors usually means uh, a warm white or even warmer color, redder color light, uh, reduced blue light. So elaborating on some of that aiming, this just illustrates that barnyard light I was telling you about in the upper left corner that your neighbors probably have that energy's given them. And the lower right just demonstrates that with proper modern new uh, fixtures, particularly LED fixtures, you can aim that light precisely where you need it. You can buy them that LED lights will put down patterns, rectangles and oblongs and circles, and uh, you can put the light where you need it. This illustrates the problem with overlighting when you go to uh, LED white light. Uh, here on the left, we've got 8,000 lumens, and on the right, we got 19,000 with the old high pressure sodium, the little pink light that we still have a lot of in our, in our city here in Little Rock and around the and around the rural areas as well. Uh, a lot of high pressure sodium, but you can see it's even, even cutting it more than a half, it's still brighter to the human eye, uh, uh, the white light is. So when you go to LED, uh, the whiter it is, the less lumens you need. And the, uh, the whiter or the bluer it is, the more yeah. harmful to creatures. That's um, right. Because the blue light is typically and primarily what's most bi bioactive. I um, visited uh, Audubon's Row Sanctuary this spring to see the sandhill cranes on the plat. And um, we went out before sunrise, an hour before sunrise, so that we would be in the blinds when the cranes started to wake up uh, or move. They were all already awake. Um, and they gave us red flashlights, which I'd never seen before. But, um, you know, I started reading up on them and I bought a red flashlight last week because I do go out at night uh, a fair amount. Um, and uh, um, I do notice a difference between that, that, that white flashlight and the red flashlight. I get a lot fewer insects flying my way with the red light. Well, and it preserves your night vision. Right. But red light does not. And so your eyes can adapt to the dark and you don't even need as much light to start with because your eyes... Uh, uh, are, are more sensitive. I, you know, I neglected to point out why the, about the, the reason for the human health effects and, and the same things happened with animals. You know, all those things I mentioned were other than this, this problem. There's a metabolic problem. And that is, is that we have receptors in our eyes that are not there for seeing. They're there to detect the time of day, the light, the light of day. Uh, and they trigger our hormone system to shift gears at night. Uh, in, and produce uh, different hormones, including particularly melatonin, which some people buy at the drugstore, try to go to sleep, <laughs> perhaps because they've been exposing themselves to too much blue light in the evening. You want to, uh, your cell phones, your computers now all come with uh, features that will remove that blue light at night. So your body can shift gears and you don't need the melatonin. Uh, but uh, that melatonin is part of your cancer defense system. And it also uh, uh, regulates or helps you uh, uh, shift gears metabolically to sleep. Uh, and this is true of animals. Insects have those sensors on the tops of their heads. They're not for seeing. They're just to detect ambient light. Uh, I thought I hid this. This just illustrates. Uh, uh, I got a lot more slides than I'm showing tonight, you know. Uh, this illustrates um, uh, how motion sensor light can be superior to, uh, to an always on light. It's just illustrative. I was told that this was taken from an actual event, uh, but 
at any rate, that's what that is. Um, we've talked about proper color. Uh, uh, warm light is far more pleasant to most people at night than in, in a night environment, perhaps because our first artificial light was a fire, <laughs> a campfire. Yeah. And uh, that's warm light. Your fireplace, a wood fire is a warm light. Uh, and it just seems cozy and safe. And white light and blue light seems surgical uh, and uh, unpleasant. This just illustrates that. This illustrates uh, a, a properly illuminated ballpark. Uh, most ballparks are not properly illuminated, partly because they were built. And the lighting systems were designed before this became a before we were aware it was a problem. This is a private uh, school in Springdale, Arkansas, uh, and they have put in a, a proper a ballpark lighting system. And you can see how it all goes down and none of it goes up. Uh, and it's uh, even and does it's functional and meets all the needs. Bruce, could you back up for just a second? Great, thank you. That is really beautiful. I was struck by how wonderful that uh, that picture looks. Um, before we move on to ordinances and legal regulations of lighting, I've got two questions for you. One um, is from Skip Rigney, and it is, is there any organized initiative? Sorry, these glasses are not the best. Old age. Is there any organized initiative to get the power companies to back off their promotion of so-called security lights? Those lights are awful. <laughs> it's been in the back of my mind and on my agenda for a long time. I, I have uh, filed two lawsuits against uh, 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 Entergy for light trespass uh, circumstances. Some, I showed you pictures from one of them, the apartment complex, uh, a neighbor uh, uh, 250 feet away could read a book in his backyard uh, uh, by that, uh, that light I showed you. Uh, and I've taken their depositions and they advertise that they provide professional lighting uh, and that that's protects your property and so forth and so on. When you take their depositions, they say, oh, we don't know anything about security. We don't have expertise in security. We don't know anything about lighting. We have no expert claim, no expert. The, the customer picked that light out and the customer told us where to put it. Uh, there is nobody at Entergy, at least when I took that last deposition, who was a, a, a trained uh, lighting expert. And that is a field of endeavor. Uh, it is. Yeah. So uh, there is a claim there. But the problem is, is that uh, uh, it's going to have to be yours truly that pursues it, I think. And I uh, can't quite uh, get it high enough on my agenda. Uh, and, and it would be a lot of work. But. I think there's a, a, a regulatory angle there, and I think it also plays into the energy picture. What about the Dark Sky Association? Are they making any moves in that regard? Well, uh, that's- Outside awful, of Arkansas? No, not that I know of. In fact, okay. I've, written them, I've written them about my idea of seeking some help because one of my problems is, is I, need, I would like to have a world-class expert on the whole security issue I don't have to have that because I can get at them for just advertising falsely. And, uh, and I think uh, would have a good shot at having the commission uh, order them to do some disclosures in their advertising about the limits of what you might expect from this light uh, yeah. and the risks uh, to the environment and their neighbors and so forth. Yeah. Um, the second question is, can you talk a little bit about bug zappers from an anonymous person? Well, uh, a lot of uh, one way a lot of those work is is that you put a light in there that attracts the bugs, and then you have an electric grid uh, that uh, zaps them. Uh, and um, so, you know, I don't know. We do. I, 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 this it sort of gets on a, a nerve of mine that, that particularly the mosquito uh, uh, abatement people uh, hit from t uh, with me. And I don't know, maybe it's not a real concern, but I don't know that people realize they, that probably when they get their yard sprayed with mosquitoes, they're also hammering 
night pollinators and bees and so forth. Yes. And at some point, we have to recognize that our comfort and convenience has to yield to preserving what's left of the natural environment, that that's more important, actually, to our collective well-being in the long run than zapping the mosquitoes in your backyard. So I don't know. I don't don't have a bug zapper. There are other ways to deal with mosquitoes that uh, that are focused on mosquitoes. There and, are. And, and if you tune in them. on August 4th, we will tell you about them. So Good. there you go. But yeah. Um, yeah, bug zappers don't discriminate, do they? So your beautiful Luna moth might wind up in a bug zapper. Exactly. Anything that flies, yeah. pretty much anything that flies at night, but particularly moths. Yeah. Okay. So um, moving on then, um, I understand that more and more municipalities, at least, um, are enacting lighting ordinances. Can you tell us about them in general and also about what any uh, municipalities in central Arkansas, including Little Rock, are doing. All right. So uh, this is a central tool to address in this problem. It's unfortunate, but uh, th this problem is a matter of individual, how we how we light individually. And you're never going to educate everybody. Uh, so we have to educate people to press for policy that began to change everybody's behavior. Uh, and, you know, this is not a unique thing. People, a lot of people get excited about, oh, an ordinance, oh, you know, my freedom and so forth and so on. Freedom. We, we do all kinds of ordinances in cities to address noise and smoking and uh, uh, animal uh, waste and control and so forth. And lighting is no different. Uh, a, a nuisance light is no different, maybe worse the nuisance sound. So we need, we need ordinances. Um, the first ordinance specifically aimed at the light pollution, I believe was Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, and they have a very comprehensive model and uh, that has become a thing in Arizona, but it's also migrated uh, to other places in the country now. So and few have the kinds of ordinances that they have in, in Arizona as well as good. Just to put on my law professor hat here for a second, an ordinance is legislation at the local government level. So either a, a, a municipality, city, town, or county can enact an ordinance, but it's the equivalent of a state law, a state statute, only at the local government level. Sorry to interrupt you. That's all right. And we, by the way, we do have a, a night sky lighting or a statute in Arkansas it's, it's pretty weak. It desperately needs to be uh, strengthened, but at least we have one. Um, uh, in Arkansas, Fort Smith, Fayetteville, Harrison, Bentonville, Springvale, uh, and some uh, design overlay districts in Little Rock have minimal, very minimal, uh, in the Little Rock instance, very minimal uh, 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 limitations. Um, uh, Fayetteville probably has the, uh, the best one, uh, Fayetteville, Harrison, and uh, uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, have probably the best one in the state. Uh, we have proposed one in Little Rock. We got the Sustainability Commission to endorse it. We have uh, some support on the city board. Unfortunately, it's got to go through the bureaucracy, and we have a, uh, a city employee who is uh, roadblocking uh, our effort at this point. Um, uh, it is not a comprehensive ordinance. We've tried to be realistic about what we can uh, do here uh, in the way of a first ordinance. We want to uh, get a, a basic one, a simple one uh, in place that maybe over time we can build on. So uh, there are about seven things that would be in a comprehensive ordinance we're, uh, that I've listed here. And we're, we're, uh, ours contains or addresses four of those, shielding, trespass, types of lighting permitted in some, to some degree, and color temperature, uh, trying to get people to use the warm colors. Uh, this can, goes, can, this, can you tell us procedurally, where, where are you at with that? Well, uh, uh, procedurally, I've sort of personally, and, and I'm the main driver behind this at this point, although there, there are other people involved, I don't want to mislead. Um, 
uh, but uh, we've shifted gears uh, a little bit to try to press for a comprehensive real world energy policy in the city into which I hope to tuck the lighting ordinance. Uh, and so we have created a new group, the Natural State uh, uh, Energy uh, Coalition, uh, which is going to focus not on state level policy. We've got other groups doing that, but strictly on municipal uh, uh, policy, m municipal practices and policy to try to, and we're starting with Little Rock. Uh, and so we've uh, got a meeting next week, in fact, with the mayor uh, who claims to be big into sustainability. Uh, and But we've had a lot of noise at the city level for years and years about being sustainable and so forth, but it never it never turns into actual action. And so uh, that's where that is right now. I, not giving up on, on, um, on giving that a freestanding effort on its own if necessary, but right now I'm tucking it in there and uh, hoping we can build a bigger coalition to move a broad spectrum energy policy that would include light pollution. Who are members okay. of your coalition? Oh, uh, uh, American Lung Association, uh, the Audubon, Arkansas Audubon, um, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a bunch. We, we have many of the mainline environmental groups uh, involved. Great. Uh, this illustrates uh, and would li like to have more. There's some missing too um, that need to be in there. Uh, but uh, this illustrates uh, the effectiveness of uh, an ordinance. On the right is Flagstaff, Arizona. On the left is Conway, Arkansas. They're the same size community. Uh, now, in fairness, Conway is getting a little bit of bleed over from Little Rock, <laughs> but the sky at the zenith over the heart of the city is six times brighter in Conway than it is in Flagstaff. Uh, and this is a picture of Flagstaff taken from the air. Uh, notice you can see the Milky Way. Uh, uh, and I've uh, in this picture, and I was told by a lawyer at the Public Service Commission uh, who used to live in Flagstaff that indeed you can see the Milky Way inside the city limits of Flagstaff. Uh, you can also see there's no shortage of lighting on the ground, even though there's not much in the sky. And you can see that the lighting for the most part is warm in color. Uh, beautiful uh, urban lighting. And this is what a uh, Flagstaff street scene looks like. There's no shortage of light there and no shortage of visibility. They have just, and no shortage of decoration either. They've not, it's not like they've shut everything down. They've just been responsible and rational about the lighting process. Uh, this is Little Rock by contrast, which is light as you will, uh, glare, uh, white light, sky glow, uh, over lighting, all the, all the sins <laughs> that I've enumerated, all four of them are, are blown all over the place. Uh, and you can see why this is bad lighting. You can see the glare, you can see the shadows, uh, you can see the clutter, uh, you can see the risk of trespass and of course the sky glow. So we're running short of time. Let's, I'm going to rush through if that's all right with you, Lynn. Yeah, we've got six close, minutes still. So close this out. And uh, this is a composite picture of the Earth taken from satellites and is a visual indicator of the larger global problem, in my mind, of which light pollution is a part and perhaps symbolic. And that is just how much we're changing the natural environment. Uh, and we need to come to grips with the consequences of that and mitigate uh, uh, and mitigate the harms. There are ways to, to capture the benefits of our technology and still uh, 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 and, and avoid the worst consequences of irresponsible conduct. This is a chart of the rate of extinction. Uh, the geologists now say we live in the Anthropocene. 
because the human impact on the earth will be forever recorded in its geology uh, uh, going forward. And not only in terms of the extinction, but the very chemical makeup of the uh, and uh, 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 and form of the uh, of our wastes and, and, and other activities will be evident in the geological record going forward. So what are we asking? All we're asking is, uh, is for pe people in our communities and our states in the country to recognize this problem and to begin to implement uh, responsible lighting practices that provide uh, the necessary illumination we need for the benefit of humanity, uh, but mitigate and minimize the environmental harm. And we know about all this because there's an entire field of illumination engineering that exists out there that is constantly studying these issues and have standards and practices. Uh, I alluded to that earlier in the picture of the apartment complex, their recommendation about how much lighting you needed in that common outdoor area. These standards exist. They can be implemented and should be implemented. And in addition to all the other uh, loss, and I alluded to this early on, uh, uh, a, a loss that should not be underestimated is the natural heritage uh, uh, resource that the night sky represents. Because I do worry of that 90% 90, 90 of young people who grow, grow up in this country today have never seen the Milky Way. They've never personally experienced their place in the universe. Uh, and I think there are social uh, 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 and cultural implications to that. Hard to define, but uh, I don't think they're probably inconsequential. So uh, uh, finally, an uh, advertisement, uh, October 21 and 22. Uh, hopefully we were going to have our first dark sky festival in Arkansas on the Tyler Bend on the uh, campground on the Buffalo National River. We tried to do this last year in the COVID uh, virus uh, required that we cancel it. Uh, the Park Service staff meet tomorrow again, one more time, hopefully, to make sure that we're kosher in all that we plan to do and, and we'll get a license to proceed and we will take this public. It's already on our website, uh, darkskyarkansas.org is our website. There's a tab for the festival, um, but uh, we'll take this public uh, sometime over the weekend or early next week. Uh, and this is going to be a, a, a chance to come out when the uh, Orionid meteor shower is near its peak and we'll have constellation tours and we will have telescope, uh, those telescopic uh, uh, views of the night sky and all galaxies and dead stars and dying stars and open clusters and globular clusters. Uh, and for a lot of people, it's going to be an eye opening experience. We'll have daytime programs and we'll have events for children. Uh, so uh, uh, I hope uh, I hope some uh, attending here can make that. Uh, I look so forward to it. Do? What? I look forward to it. It sounds like a lot of fun. I think I've already said what you can do. Uh, you can, of course, join ANSA, Arkansas yeah. Natural Sky Association. You can join the IDA. If you sit, live in the city, you need to call your city director and complain that, that we don't have an ordinance, a uh, lighting ordinance. Uh, we will get back around to pushing that. And the only way it's ever going to go through is for people to, you know, the squeaking wheel gets the grease. So I thank you, Lynn. I think you've got one more slide. Do I? Yeah. Oh. Uh, there you go. You've already said, though, so. Yeah, I've already said it. That's it. Well, Bruce, perfect timing. We have one minute to go. So <laughs> first... Thank you so much for sharing your considerable expertise and passion with us tonight. These action steps, if you want a closer look at them, will be available on YouTube tomorrow. I believe Cal's will be emailing you the link. Friend me on Facebook for posts about nature. And remember that our next webinar, Ask the Natural Gardeners, where we're going to talk about uh, mosquitoes and how to get rid of them, will, among other things, many other things, will be Thursday, August 4th. So thank you, everybody. One more thing. One more thing. Yeah. I see there are 28 chat uh, items that we obviously could not address. Uh, uh, if people have questions, thoughts, observations, email me, uh, Bruce 
at macmathlaw.com. We did get to everything, but do email Bruce with all your questions. Yeah. So. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Good night. <laughs>